Can you hear me in the back? Hello. Hi. I hope everyone's good and caffeinated, sugar high. Uh, this is a talk about people. Pause for effect. Um, a front-end style guide is basically a solution to a people problem, an organizational problem. Excuse me. And um, so this talk is going to go into some technical tooling stuff, but really what I want you to keep in mind as we're going is that this is really about people and about your organization and about working uh, in different teams. So uh, my name is Mark Wunsch. That's my Twitter handle, at Mark Wunsch. You can send me a toot, please. Uh, I would appreciate it. So I work at a company called uh, Rent the Runway. Rent the Runway is... Uh, well, we describe it as a Cinderella experience as a service. So uh, our customers come in, they rent a dress, we ship them a dress, they ship it back to us after a weekend. Usually it's sort of a high-end designer gown. This thing is just coming down off my head. It's upside down. Hold on, ready? We got this, we got this. Okay, so, um, and then what happens is our customers, after they rent the dress, they sort of take pictures of themselves, share it with the community. Um, so the, uh, the interesting thing about uh, the website that I, I work on, Rent the Runway, is that it's somewhere between a e-commerce experience and like a hotel experience, because you're saying, I want to rent this dress. And that interface challenge is going to... Uh, I guess, inform some of this talk. Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so show of hands, this is the interactive portion of the talk. Uh, how many people work at a company or organization where the designers are separate from the developers? They're sort of two different teams. Yeah, a lot of you. Wow, OK. So big companies, that, that happens a lot. Um, so you're the audience for the talk. So congratulations. Um, I, I split up the agenda in these three parts here. Um, it, it was like a building metaphor that went kind of bad. So before we really get into it, I, I want to sort of set the stage for what I'm going to be talking about. Um, a lot of words have been spilled about front-end style guides, how to make them, what they're for, what they do, and you'll hear all kinds of things like, uh, this is a style guide, but it's not bootstrap. Or uh, maybe you'll, you've heard, like, bootstrap is considered harmful, and all of this FUD around what a style guide is or isn't. Um, so uh, let's just talk about where we stand. So I'm going to go ahead and put the appendix here at the beginning of the talk. Um, so let's just take all of these articles and links as a given. So this is where we stand, right? And if you read all of these articles, which are all sort of uh, important works, um, they will all talk about building a style guide and what a style guide is. And uh, the idea is in order to preserve some kind of design integrity in your interface, you need some kind of living document, which uh, acknowledges the default state of documentation as being dead. And what this document is for is to outline acceptable usage. So uh, is everybody familiar with object-oriented CSS? That's a thing. Yeah, uh, Nicole Sullivan wrote this methodology for organizing CSS and building CSS components. Um, and she's, it's like the standard, you know, she's as important to our industry as someone like uh, Crockford or that guy who wrote jQuery. Um, <laughs> so, um, so we live in this sort of post OO CSS world. SAS and less and stylus are all very accepted tools in our work. Um, so if this is ground floor. If this is true, what else must be true? So when we talk about code and style guides for writing code, I think all of us in this room might acknowledge that documentation is not enough. Right? You need something else. Um, and for us, for JavaScript developers, that tool is like JS Lint. We use JS Lint to enforce good style. We can't rely on documentation alone. 
Uh, this is the JS Lint like slogan, and I, I really hate it. Like, JS Lint will hurt your feelings, and then go on to Hacker News and write about misandry. Uh, it's a jerk. So I, I don't want to be pedants about style, right? I don't want to hurt people's feelings, and obviously there's JS Lint and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but what if we thought about tooling and the same sets of tooling we think about for writing JavaScript and apply that to design? You know, what does a design linter look like? Uh, this is something you would give to your design team. They would run it through their designs, and all of a sudden, uh, the site would behave as expected. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, we need tooling to enforce our style guides. Um, I chose this painting because it's got a bunch of guys with like hammers and stuff. So that it was like tooling. That was the link here. Uh, so it's a, it shows the Roman god Vulcan, who is the uh, Roman god of neckbeards, and they're looking at Apollo like, what? What are you doing? Uh, like, so I think that like uh, the the guys working the forge or the developers and Apollo in this painting is like the designer, and they're like, what? What are you talking about? You this, I can't work with this. And there's actually a lot of subtext to this painting, so you should look up the Wikipedia for it But um, after the presentation. Uh, so this talk is called Green Fields. Is everybody familiar with that term, what a green field project is? Just nod vaguely, yeah. So green field is a project that is uh, lacks constraint by prior work, right? So you you're a building developer, you go out on a green field, you can start doing whatever you want. Um, the analogy is construction on a green field land, so no constraints. But for development, most work is uh, brown field work. So what's, what's brown field work? Brown field work is land previously used for industrial purposes. Uh, or some commercial use. So that's like toxic waste. So compare your development project roughly to like fresh kills in Staten Island. And I, I think that's usually what you're kind of working with. So I think in order to build a project and to think about style guides and design in this sort of holistic way, we need to sort of understand like what, what is it that we're working on? What are we standing on? Um, why do we even need a style guide? So let's talk about that tooling. So uh, the DOM is where we get all of the truth. It's, it's a photo of Dom DeLuise. That's the joke. Um, so the DOM is where we get the truth. So we, uh, instead of looking at documentation and all this other stuff to try to figure out what what is the design of our site, what should our interface look like, let's Let's look at what we have now. How do we look and see? Uh, how do we make an audit of uh, where we understand? Um, and this way, this gives us an opportunity to understand sort of the diversity that we're dealing with. So I'm going to show you some, some JavaScript program. And this is a JavaScript program that is, uh, I don't know if you can see it, it's an extension to the HTML element interface. And what this little piece of JavaScript does is it's going to uh, replicate an element. So what do I mean by replicate? Well, so what this uh, is going to do is, given an element, it's going to sort of clone it, and then also sort of copy the styles, the computed styles, out of the DOM. So if you think about a piece of the DOM, usually it's without styles, right? The styles are applied um, by the browser. And what this does is it says, you need to take out not just the DOM node that you're interested in, but all of the styling information associated with it. Because when we think about building user interfaces, when we think about designing user interfaces, we're thinking about this sort of atomic piece. What is this atomic unit that you're going to use to design your site? And so what this script does is pulls that out with the style. So we can see what that element looks like in isolation from the rest of its uh, context. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to turn to PhantomJS. So uh, this is not a talk about Phantom. Phantom is a really cool tool, but I'm going to use Phantom to sort of uh, work my way through trying to understand what what is going on in the DOM. Uh, so this is CoffeeScript. Don't 
be alarmed. You know, it's a JavaScript conference, but uh, I've left some code out. This is what I passed to Phantom. And what this basically does is, given a selector and given a URL, it's going to parse that DOM, find that selector, replicate it, basically take that element out of its context, clip it, take a screenshot of it, and then output the markup that generates it. So what we're going to see is, for a given element, what is its visual representation when taken outside of its context, outside of its parent nodes, and then what is the markup used to generate that visuals. So when I do this on Render Runway, uh, this is the atomic unit or an atomic unit of Render Runway. And I don't know if you can see the markup next to it, um, but uh, this is a product, or one version of a product, and this is the markup that you would produce, be it in your application or writing by hand, to create a product. And there's a couple of things here. Um, the call to action is not centered What's going on with that? Well, that's because the parent node is actually in charge of centering the call to action in our CSS. So that's kind of strange. We've sort of decoupled part of our CSS implementation in order to get this sort of node. So when you take that node out of the DOM with its style information, it doesn't have enough information to really render it as it should look. Uh, this is another product. So on another page, this is how we represent a product. So it's the same information, the same data. But look what's going on here. Uh, there's kind of crazy markup, like way more than there should be, and uh, there's no image. So what's going on here? Well, um, this is the responsive clown car technique. Is everybody familiar with it? Like a kind of a little hack to get responsive images. Um, and I'm not faulting the technique or the tooling. Sorry? Yeah, there's markup. It's, and it's a lot. I'll put the slides up later. But you, it's like, it's like whoa, you look at it and you're like, this, this is a lot of markup. Yeah, sorry. It didn't really come out. Because it's really tiny because I had to fit a lot of it. Um, but like, just this is kind of strange that we have two representations of basically the exact same data structure. Um, and they're represented both in markup and visually completely different. And actually, uh, take a close look at like the way the brand name of the product is capitalized. And if we go back here, you'll see that it's not quite the same. So something happened in our design team, in our handover process, or whatever, that um, we kind of forgot how we you know, capitalize. What's the right way, the rent the runway style for capitalization? So I'm going to show you one more product. This is also the exact same thing. Uh, I don't know if you can see the markup, but it's really similar to the uh, first one. Um, but it's n not the same. And there's no text here. It's just an image um, because that text appears on hover. So again and again, here's the same unit, the same at atom, to use sort of the, the terminology of atomic web design. Um, represented in markup three different ways and represented visually three different ways. And there's more of those on our site. Um, so you can see just by doing this really simple auditing that we have so many variations of the, basically the same thing. And what we can do with that is then go back to the design team and say, look, um, we have to figure this out. We need a style guide because we keep deviating both in code and in design. So I said earlier that this is a talk about working with other people, and we can't talk about developing style guides without sort of this organizational aspect. Uh, so uh, here's, here's sort of one of the uh, big reveals of this talk. Uh, there's not a style guide, like a document. You are the style guide. You're the developer, right? The designer doesn't need to know everything there is to know about web development to make something look good. But you are the person responsible for taking your designer by the hand and leading them through the hell that is web development. And I don't know if you can see this picture, but it's a Dante's Inferno reference. That's why I said hell. So, thanks, projector. Um, and we can't talk about like this communication gulf 
without talking about Photoshop. Like Photoshop is like the bane of every developer's existence, I think, right? Because designers in large in organizations basically use Photoshop and produce some Photoshop artifact. And the worth of that artifact as you get closer and closer to production basically approaches zero. Like it's worth nothing by the time you actually launch your app or your website or whatever. Uh, so this is a tool used by uh, designers to visualize interface. And it, it works really well when you're presenting to executives, but it, it, it loses something because it's completely removed from the actual medium that you guys are all working in. And so I, I don't advocate that all designers should learn how to write code. Um, because you don't hire designers because of their elite Photoshop skills. Or you hire them because they have a great eye. Um, designers should not have to know about the vagaries of SEO and CSS box models. Because that's not their job, that's your job, I'm sorry to say. So the style guide, right, is this contract that you write with the design team. And when something deviates from that guide, it's an explicit deviation. Doesn't mean it's a bad thing, it just means you're sort of going, ag going against the grain on purpose. Um, but you can sort of incorporate that back. And so the next thing to talk about is like, what is it that we're actually building? So now we've got the designers on our side. We've seen what we're working with. Uh, what's next? Um, so the living document, or whatever you want to call it. So these two teams are, are going to produce something together. And I, I kind of like to think about the product of this collaboration as uh, scaffolding. You're building a temporary structure in order to build the real structure, the web app, the mobile web app, the, I don't know. I don't know what else we build. We're JavaScript developers. So. Um, so I'm interested in getting to the nut. Like, what is it that we're actually building? So we talked before about the DOM being the source of truth, right? Everything that we produce ends up as a DOM node somewhere. And so I talked about Nicole Sullivan. Uh, who spread the gospel of object-oriented CSS. Uh, but I think there's something missing. Uh, we keep using that phrase, object-oriented. I don't think it means what you think it means. Um, what's missing whenever we talk about object-oriented? Um, and the thing that's missing is encapsulation. So encapsulation or information hiding, depending on uh, how much of a pedant you are, is one of the primary tenets of object-oriented programming. And in web development, we really suck at it. So what are the implementation details of an atom in the system? So you get, those things get exposed all the time. Right? You misspell a class attribute, and all of a sudden, the implementation details just leak all over uh, your browser. Um, we constantly overstep object boundaries whenever we're writing CSS and markup. Right? And it, it looks kind of like this. Right? We expose these kind of Byzantine markup schemas where you don't really know what's going on, but you know, if you, uh, you, you sort of just assume that the div that doesn't have a class is the one that you want to do stuff on, and you can hide this in like a Ruby like ERB helper or whatever you, you use. But uh, the things that HTML is really lousy at is all of that object-oriented stuff. Inheritance, composition, encapsulation. So instead of thinking about object-oriented CSS, you know, I, I think what we really need is uh, like object-oriented HTML. Oh, shit. Web components. Web components are a thing, and they're awesome. Um, and they're awesome because they provide you with inheritance, encapsulation, polymorphism. And you end up with one primitive, which is the element, right? So listen, uh, from the source here, not many people outside of the NYC JavaScript community know about this exciting new spec. And now you know, out-of-towners, whatever. Uh, so. 
web components provide these object-oriented things. So like uh, Mr. Dale spoke about earlier, let's talk about Polymer, which is this project that sort of is this glue code because web components are a lot of different things. Uh, they're custom elements, shadow DOM, uh, pointer events. Uh, so Polymer sort of glues all these things together and provides an interface for you to work with them. Um, and why are custom elements good and particularly suited for style guides is because you can define behavior and interface without exposing implementation details. So what do I mean? So here's the thing, here's an example. So designers, so there, we're selecting a couple of things and then we're gonna close that box. So does everybody catch that? I'll play it again, maybe. Is that going on? Yeah, whatever. So you select a couple of things from this box because designers, for whatever reason, love uh, designing select boxes over and over again. I don't know why, they, they just have a thing, right? This is, the behavior of this is a select multiple. Um, this exists in HTML, the browser knows what to do with this. You get all of these great APIs for free when you implement this. But in order to get to this design, you end up with all of these really nasty implementation details. So uh, the way this particular, like it's nested divs, the way this particular element, which comes right out of Rent the Runway, is built is with something like, um, it's uh, an anchor tag with an href of target JavaScript void zero or whatever. It's like, that's a mess. And that's this implementation detail that you're exposed to. Um, so what Polymer provides, and this is an example that comes like right out of their fact, is um, this uh, API for building a custom select element. Right? So what this, all this does is it basically delegates to this hidden select element. And so uh, all of the API details are sort of obfuscated away and you're just left with this clean element. So imagine if instead of dealing with all of the markup and visual representations I showed earlier, all we deal with is an element or a library. So all the implementation details are hidden. So you're not relying on this like documentation, living document, whatever you want to call it, you're relying on an element. Um, you've codified it and in an essence you've automated that away. So if you think about uh, the brown field we were looking at, we saw all of this basically same interface with wildly different implementation details. And now we've unified it. So what we're really kind of talking about isn't so much a design linter, we're talking about uh, type safety in some way. So this is an enforced codified contract that developers must adhere to. Um, what the web component approach does is it allows us to get close to that. So the contract that developers write up with designers is this element. Um, so the talk is called Green Fields and Front End Style Guides, uh, or some might be flipped actually, but style guides aren't enough. What you need is some sort of definition because we've seen that works with things like linting, that works with something like Java. Um, so does, instead of thinking about our design as this documentation piece, we should instead think about it as living libraries. Um, one day, I've been in a lot of organizations where designers have been sort of separate from development. And I hope that just by continuously reinforcing the tooling parts of our job onto the designers, that sort of we can eventually get to this point where, you know, Dom DeLuise and fine art can live together harmoniously in our green field. Uh, I'm finishing kind of early, but that's the talk. Thank you very much.